And now, from the CFTK TV studios, this is Open Connection with your host, Robert Picto. Welcome to Open Connection. I'm your host, Robert Picto. For Love is a film of resilience and resurgence. Colonization has led to many adverse aspects on the indigenous population in Canada, most significantly on families and social structures. On today's Open Connection, director Matt Smiley. And I was just starting to put out um, Highway of Tears, which obviously had focused on the missing and murdered women in, in northern British Columbia. And, you know, that that process in particular, uh, as you know, but viewers might not know, really happened by mistake and by chance. And it was having grown up in Canada, but left uh, at that point, probably for about 10 years. I hadn't grown up knowing really all the history of, of Indigenous people across the country. And it was really in finding out a, about a couple of stories along Highway 16 that I started um, developing into a film project initially. It wasn't a documentary. And then that really shifted when I started talking to a couple of family members, many of which, which you know. Um, and it really grabbed me by the heart. And one thing was like, I could not do a feature film on that, a fiction, um, that this was really several years ago and still is a, a very raw and hard topic that wasn't getting a lot of attention. And I think since, and it's, you know, thanks to work like you, and I feel like we collaborate in a certain sense, that people are aware of it. And, uh, and so from that, from that standpoint, I think that was successful. And, and to have the film be screened all across the world and I think also doing really well on Netflix when it really came out I think that definitely helped a lot in terms of the the, the public dialogue and of course one of those things that you did when you actually were here in Terrace is we had kind of like a a, a, a talk back session that happened um, did you have what were some of the reactions that you were having around the world when you had those different talk back sessions in those local communities one thing that was interesting and one thing that I never really anticipated was really people's engagement and I think them getting struck emotionally. And I think that the main part was them not knowing about this. Obviously, people in the area uh, within the communities know about it. But I think as you started to get into bigger city centers or different countries, even like in Germany, uh, where they weren't aware of, of these missing and murdered cases, um, I think it really started striking a chord and people wondering what can they do, what can they do, what can they do. And I think one of those big things was that I think the more people talked about it, the more awareness that started to build. And I think one of the most surprising things for me throughout that process was in certain cities, let's just focus on Canada in particular, even in Montreal, um, where people were like, oh, well, we don't really have that problem here. And, you know, and then within a couple of days, you'd start getting emails and messages of people really realizing, holy cow, actually, in almost every single province and territory, we have it. Now we know with obviously the National Inquiry, that this is, you know, become quite a huge, it's hard to call it a topic, but it's something that, that, that everybody needs to realize that they need to pay attention to. Last year, I guess you could say Canada lost its innocence um, when um, the bodies of uh, 215 uh, children were found. Um, what was your reaction to that? Um, uh, well, I think uh, emotionally, because I can even see it in you and I, and I obviously know you well and know your, yourself as an artist and your history also with, with regards to that. And we've had personal conversations about it. And I think for me personally, having had the opportunity to travel over the country, not just with Highway of Tears, but obviously with For Love in, in, in a big way, is that you know, I know, and, and very many of the other community leaders and community members know, 
that this is not a surprise and it wasn't a surprise. Um, I think the scope of it was way bigger. And I think one of the things that really struck a chord is obviously living here in the US. Once that really hit international news and then people realized that dark, dark, dark history of what happened to these children, um, that there is that, that global community acknowledgement that this happened, um, you can't, help but feel sad. You can't help but feel angered. And I think it really ignited uh, some sort of passion too, not just in Canadians, but a worldwide community to be like, what happened? And what can we do to ensure that this never repeats itself? And I think also the US, you, you know, especially with um, Deb Holland, who's now uh, in power in terms of seeing what they were doing also in the United States and uncovering uh, mass graves. I think we're really still in the early steps, much like when we first started our dialogue with missing and murdered women. This is a very, very similar topic in a, in a, in a weird manner, but um, one that's going to really unravel in terms of we don't know a lot of these stories. And I think once the, the, the real acknowledgement all across North America and what that history really is and embracing the, the, the negative things that happen, but also with what we're trying to do now with this new film is showcase that beautiful resilience and making sure that that culture stays there, all the different you know vibrant cultures. <laughs> Open Connection will be right back after these messages. And now from the CFTK TV studios, this is Open Connection with your host, Robert Picto. Thank you for staying with us. Best-selling Canadian singer-songwriter Shania Twain has narrated For Love, a documentary feature that centers on the over-representation of Indigenous children in the Canadian foster care system. Twain is a longtime child's rights advocate via her Shane's Kids Can Foundation. Let us return to the conversation with director Matt Smiley. I had actually read uh, her book and Mary and I had shared it together um, because I think a little bit of her history is not quite well known throughout Canada. Obviously, she's a massive superstar, um, but her connection to the issue, and I knew she had um, an organization for, for children that she's been doing for years before I would say it's quote unquote um, the cool thing to do for celebrities to, to help out. She's really always put her heart towards the children. Um, and she also prevented her siblings from, from going into the foster care system. And I would say her dad, which on a technical terms for her, it's her father, um, but technically her, her stepdad did um, pass away in a, in a car accident with her mom. And he was obviously indigenous. And so she, she did grow up uh, in community and knowing all those struggles and, and, and being a part of that. The beginnings of For Love uh, was actually, it started with Highway of Tears. And I think with Highway of Tears, we weren't in a pandemic, ended up doing a little over 70 cities myself, <laughs> running around all over the place, which was exhausting, but also exhilarating because you really got to, to, to share and to hear people and, and, and to to engage and learn more about each individual community. Um, but one person in particular in striking up a conversation who, had, who was actually, in, uh, I had interviewed was Mary Tiji, who's part of Carrier Sakani Family Services. And they were obviously one of the governing bodies for the missing and murdered women in, in the North, um, was initially, obviously when I first started doing the, um, the film, I was not welcome with open hands because obviously, you know, there, there, there's a, a, a protection barrier there. And throughout the process, I think of Mary and Terry TG and, and various other people surrounding that project, realizing where my heart was at and what I was trying to do or not knowing what I was trying to do. But on that on that journey is we really developed a friendship and throughout that friendship and throughout the process. I also do think that the, the Netflix boost helped it helped a lot because I know Mary was traveling back and forth, obviously meeting with Cindy Blackstock and all the uh, people on the National uh, um, National Advisory Committee uh, as people would recognize her, uh, you know, in the planes and stuff like that and wanting to engage and learning more. And with this, we started talking about what she was working on and getting deeper into 
what are those policies? What's happening, not just in Northern BC, but kind of all across Canada? And just seeing and being privy to a little bit of that work. And it took us a little while to discuss what they're doing for children and not just their organization, but the various organizations across the country and the lack of funding at, at the time. And that's really how it started was a dialogue. And then obviously there was uh, members of indigenous services that really wanted to showcase now that there's an acknowledgement that prevention as in let's not put kids into care, but prevent them from going into care. And that to me was, was a pretty I say it's a fascinating topic, but I, you know, I, I was privy to learning what a lot of communities were doing without any prevention funding, and uh, and the opportunity to to travel the country with Mary and also guided with with Cindy Blackstock as well to see what others are doing to showcase some of those communities that are really rising above and putting some of that trauma I say behind. It's still there but showcasing what they're doing because some some communities aren't as in tune with how they can really move forward or work within their own self-governance but also in collaboration with with the canadian government or, or provincial governments to ensure that they have the the proper funding to take care of their people open connection will be right back after these messages And now, from the CFTK TV studios, this is Open Connection with your host, Robert Picto. Welcome back to Open Connection. Documentary filmmaking is a non-fiction style of filmmaking that seeks to document some aspect of reality. Documentary filmmakers often choose subject matter they're passionate about, and a great documentary can be about any non-fiction, real-world subject. Let us return to the conversation with Matt Smiley. There's one thing if you actually go out and do the interviews and you you get the film now, you got to put it together. How was that processed? <laughs> this one was particularly difficult in terms of piecing it all together. Um, number one, we did shoot in almost every single province and territory in Canada, which had its own set of uh, of difficult issues. Um, and the one thing was, is from the get go, we were very keen on doing a feature documentary and not a documentary series. And the main thing was, and the main ask of, of me was from an indigenous standpoint, and this would be Mary, Cindy, and, and various other leaders that we worked with was, we know our stories, but the world doesn't. And it's how do we present this to a, a global audience for them to understand in a fairly quick and concise manner what's happening and how do we showcase the negative aspects and the beauty of it. And then the editing process made it very difficult because going and shooting everywhere, we knew that, and I knew as a filmmaker, we weren't going to showcase every single territory that we went in. So it really became... A difficult process, especially we went through a pandemic during during the editing process and some of the filming. So it, it was tough. And and I did rely on a lot of people um, to counsel me in terms of I might be in love with stuff visually as a filmmaker where we had all the right equipment, knowing we would have a great day of filming because sometimes you never know what you're going to get. And then at other times, it's just you alone, you know, <laughs> somewhere uh is is you know a trial and error in terms of seeing what pieces together and what really tells the story and there was a lot of dialogue especially between mary and i in the in the writing process of she might have been really attached to something and i'd be like well it's not going to help propel it forward uh, and then there are certain elements where she would be like, oh, no, that's not important, you know, but and then I'd be like, well, I think a lot of people don't know about that. And then, you know, if we couldn't come to a consensus ourselves, we'd send it to five, six people in, in chunks and be like, what, you know, and then so it was, a, it was an interesting process. And obviously during the pandemic, interesting because you could really interact with a lot of people virtually, too. So one of the now, where was the 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 first uh, viewing of this documentary? So the the first viewing, and it was something that we had talked about uh, quite at length, was at the um, Vancouver Convention Center, 
and uh, which is a big, beautiful building. And we did it on Truth and Reconciliation Day. And it was really important, even though we were literally in the final steps of finishing the movie. Uh, obviously, the ultimate goal is, is working on getting on, on streamers and out to the general public. Um, but it was also important. And I think the dynamics have changed over the years. And it's important to acknowledge um, some of the response and feedback, even from people who hadn't seen the film yet in terms of the choice to pick a non-Indigenous director to do it. Um, I know there was a little bit of pushback from certain places as far as not being able to support the film. Um, and then, you know, to, to Mary and Cindy's credit, and then obviously with Shania Twain jumping on board, it's important to show the film to a lot of the, the leaders and policymakers uh, and really acknowledge and do something special for Truth and Reconciliation Day. And that was a very, very beautiful event and also kind of tough to put on because in September we were still very much in the crux as we are now, but a, a little bit more so in terms of strategic planning to get people together. And uh, it was the biggest space that we could have the most people in a very safe, distanced way to have a, a really strong dialogue. And that I do feel helps ignite also the story in terms of having them them acknowledge the work that's being done and and their work too because there's a lot of people there that that's what they do on a, every, a given basis open connection will be right back after these messages and now from the cftk tv studios this is open connection with your host robert picto Mammoth Lake Film Festival is a five-day festival that screens independent features and shorts in the spectacular setting of Mammoth Lake, California. In this final segment of Open Connection, Matt updates us about the documentary, For Love. Um, but we actually just won Best Documentary Feature at the Mammoth Film Festival this past weekend, and we just started screening in February, so we're, we're off to a, a really great start. And what marked me there in particular is industry professionals who are not easily emotionally grabbed. Uh, it's tough to get, you know, filmmakers to, to, to uh, obviously they're sensitive people, um, but to see people that I didn't know that aren't my friends that are in the theater or friends of, of our collective team and grown men and women really in tears after the film and asking, what can I do? I couldn't believe this. Uh, it, I know that we're on the right track and that that I feel is a great thing because as we go along this year, there's so many amazing things that are happening in Canada, especially within First Nations, Métis and Inuit territories, as far as prevention funding and laws changing to ensure that there, there is that power. And if the film helps in a certain way to demystify that for not just non-Indigenous Canadians, and I'm sure a lot of Indigenous, because throughout this process too, and when we're dealing with, with foster kids, is not knowing their history, which I'm, I'm sure you've met a lot of people, and even men and women in their 50s and 60s starting or hearing the sounds of a drum, and they don't understand why it's impacted them, and then they, they, they start to learn about their history. That to me is, is number one, fascinating, but also leading me to believe that, that, uh, that we're on the right track. I don't, I don't think so. I mean, you know, at, at the end of the day, this film is, is really a love letter to the children. And, uh, you know, when Mary reached out for us to work on this together, you know, that, that was kind of the intention. And I think, you know, um, seeing some of the kids and the youths, uh, you know, we do follow, follow the tribal journeys on their canoes uh, to watch some of the youth too that have come to some of the screenings and participated in the Q and A's that have been part of the system and some that still are, to watch how much confidence they've gained in themselves to see themselves on a, you know, a big screen. We even had some from, from Coimant Leyland that came to our LA screening. And, you know, at, they feel acknowledged. There's a, a dream aspect there. And I think this is very much just the beginning. I mean, over the last couple of years, we've seen, we've seen a lot of great things, even from a lot of um, 
indigenous filmmakers and creators and whatever. And so I think we're kind of in the in the hot spot of a, of a really fun couple of years ahead and making sure that we don't forget about the past either. As far as watching the film, we've just started our, our festival circuit. Uh, we did Santa Monica Film Festival and then Mammoth Film Festival where we won Best Documentary. And now, um, obviously, Cindy Blackstock and the Caring Society, they've had uh, have a heart day for um, many years now, I think 15. I might be wrong on that. Um, but uh, so we're going to do some special screenings in Prince George on uh, February 14th. Um, but in in because this world is, is changing, we also want to make sure that people have the opportunity to watch it in person, but also virtually. Um, we're making the film accessible for four days on February 14th. It's going to be on Inventive, and I know um, there'll be a link on our website, uh, forlovefilm.com. It's also will be peppered all over our socials, and I know Shania uh, Twain's also been posting about it. Uh, so there will be an online link where people can donate. All the proceeds for the tickets are gonna to go to um, youth programs. Um, there's some in, in BC and also Shania Kids Can, uh, which has been working with Go Day and also United Thunder Bay and, and helping. And they've started servicing a lot of um, uh, indigenous communities as well over in that Thunder Bay area. And then between Cindy, Mary and Warner Adams from Carrier Sakani, uh, they'll be picking some other youth programs across the country to see where where some of those funds can go. So I think to me, that's the best um, recipe is to see those kinds of uh, engagements, whether it's helping kids with their beating programs and they can do something where we can actually have uh, an impact uh, right away, which is really what this film is about. So it will be available online. There'll be postings a little bit all over our social media pages and also at the Cineplex Theater in Prince George on, on February 14th. Indigenous children are vastly disproportionately overrepresented in the child welfare system. I'm constantly afraid. Even if I know I'm doing the right things, I still am constantly afraid of the fear that someone could even take my kid. All these kids that I paddle with, we're all kids in care, so we barely know who we are and we don't know where we come from and where our roots are. And then just that little bit of information, we can travel way back to our ancestors and we can figure out who we are. This is about co-creating a society where every kid counts, every kid is worth the money, and where everyone's differences are not overcome, but they're celebrated. We've got to recognize that this is not a one shot and then we, you think about something else. But the important thing is to make sure that in fact we continue to progress. I feel like the more you know what's going on with other people, the more we can relate and the more we can help each other. To be proud, you have to be proud of where you've been and who you are. You can't forget that. Thank you for joining us for this episode of On The Connection. The greatest distance in the existence of man is not from here to there, but the connection from his mind to his heart. If we can conquer that distance, we can soar like an eagle and realize our immensity within. I'm Robert Pictone.